the director of the uh, Amsterdam Museum of Natural History, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he stayed with, uh, for about 20 days or a month over there doing research in Los Roques. And that's where we met, actually. So it's been 40 years since we've seen each other. He left and we never see each other again. Uh, he actually helped me uh, review some of one, my first uh, scientific manuscript, which was my my master thesis from Venezuela. So he's uh, taught uh, courses in here in coral reef ecology and on the water field methods, and then his research been concentrating on the comparison of coral reef survey methods. Uh, I've been a professor of biology at the European School in Luxembourg from 82 to 2010, now he's retired. He authored over uh, 40 scientific uh, publications and 50 books in many different languages. Now. So, we have to do a uh, Steve, welcome. Thank you. And he's going to talk today about pioneer of the water research half a century ago. So. Thank you for giving me the floor. Yeah, all of you. Um, of course, it's, uh, it's very moving for me to be in a, in a classroom at Magueyes again, 42 years later. I'm very pleased to be here. And you are not going to learn anything from the talk that I'm going to give, uh, because the things that I'm going to talk about are totally obsolete. But I think it might be interesting for you. I, I have been around the, the lab, of course, I've seen the equipments that, uh, that, you did, that you have nowadays to do research, whereas in my days, almost half a century ago, uh, we had to do with strings and hammers. Um, I'm going to talk, and I'm sorry, this is in French. I had an English one, but it got lost. But it's about you. You understood that probably uh, ecology of uh, Mediterranean optocorals, uh, observations in the field, experiments underwater, and experiments in the lab. Now, it, this goes back even further than you might think. If you can see, this is uh, 70 years ago, approximately. Um, this is my brother, that's me, and I'm starting to be interested in the underwater world, especially in the Mediterranean, of course, because that's where I start. Shall I do this? Is that okay with you? Yeah, no worries. Um, in southern France, in 1958, uh, my father, who was one of the first scuba divers of the Netherlands, brought a group of scuba enthusiasts to southern France, to Cassis. There are kind of fjords in, in southern France there. And I was 11 years old. I was the smallest boy of my class, and I was skinny like this. And I was only doing snorkeling. But then one of my father's friends looked at me and said, you want to try scuba? And I looked at my dad, is it all right? And he said, you want to? Of course I want to. So they, uh, they equipped me. I was already equipped for snorkeling, so I had my bathing trunks, I had my slippers, and I had my mask and snorkel. And they put this huge air tank on my back that was uh, bought from the, the, the old German uh, Navy, and with a two, two holes regulator. And then they, that was all. No, no, PCB uh, didn't exist, no depth gauge, no nothing. Uh, that was the equipment. And uh, they said, it's a little bit crowded here on the boat. Hop overboard and wait for us there. So I hopped overboard, but this tank was so heavy that the tank went right down to the bottom, 10 meters deeper, 30 feet. Uh, I suppose, I don't remember that. I suppose the tank hit the bottom first, and I had four legs up. Anyway, uh, I thought, did they want me to wait up there or down here? But since I was down here, I, uh, I, I stayed there. And the first thing that struck me these yellow Gorgonians that are typical in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, I won't bother you with the Latin names. Well, they come later. And um, this was what, what in psychology is called an imprinting. I was not at all interested in natural history later on in school. I was more into geology. And I hesitated when I uh, finished high school, I hesitated between art school and Geology. So I chose geology, 
And during the course of geology, I, I, we have also had biology courses, and we had a fantastic professor who taught things about the, 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 the innards going on in the cell, and I was to a cell biologist, I decided that. And then later on, oops, sorry. Uh, Later on, I uh, decided that these Gorgonians were the thing that I was going to study. And I did that during five years in Bagnuski. Maybe we can, yes, thank you. Yeah, it will be a little bit better. Um, so I, I worked in the marine lab in Bagnuski-sur-Mer in, in southern France for several years. And one of the things that struck me was that the different species of Gorgonians they live under different circumstances. Unicella, which is these white ones, they live on bottoms that look upward to, to the sea surface. Paramericia, they are dark red, but on this picture they are, appear almost black. They are all, always on vertical ledges. And then there is Corallium rubrum, which is the, the, the precious red coral that, that is used in jewelry. Oops, that one is a little bit taller than one. No, never mind. Corallium lives in, in holes, under ceilings, so they lived under different circumstances. And then I decided to find out why, that's ecology. And uh, there I, I extended this to all the octocorals of the Mediterranean. This one is a very small species creeping on the, on the bottom, Cornularia, um, and then the one. That one, so two species of Stoloniferans. Third one, you'll come back to those later. That's an Alcyonium uncrusting. Uh, here you see the red Gorgonium, but it's, it was overgrown by two uh, color variants of this encrusting Alcyonarian. The quality of these pictures, I mean, they are 45 years old. Okay? Um, Alcyonium, which really looks like an Alcyonarian. Azella, a species that I renamed because it, it, was, a, it was a very long name. El Alcyonium, very nice one, translucent, very rare. Here's the white Gorgonian, which is extremely common. And that's the red Gorgonium from the vertical ledges. And last but not least, the precious coral. Some detail of the polyps. Beautiful species. Now, the white Gorgonium, which is very common, um, spawns every summer. And it is, it is possible to see when they start spawning because you can see the larvae in the, in the polyps, so they are about to, to be spawned. And that is useful for experiments, but also to understand the life cycle. So this is day zero. Uh, the larvae have just been spawned. And then they, they are floating. They have, of course, uh, a cilia. And then they settle on the bottom and start imaginating. And then they start uh, developing their septi, and it becomes an octocoral with eight uh, tentacles. And it goes on until you have the first polyp of the colony. And you can see here that it is covered in spicula, in small calcareous uh, uh, skeletal elements. Dave, is it why because of lack of lonatelli, or? Some, some of my species have so spectacular. This one, uh, Unicella singularis, uh, it has an azoxantelic form and one with it. So, oh. Oh. Now, this, these are the, the young polyps, the, the, the start of a new colony. And we are talking about something that is one centimeter high, approximately. Sorry? Is there a No, no, these are the, these are stelites. The And 
it slowly starts developing. After a few months, you have young colonies with two, three, four polyps. Now, working on the water, it says, is limited in time. All of you who do scuba, you know that. Um, the, the, the thumb rule in those days was depth plus meters is 60. So 50, let's say 50 minutes and 10 meters and 40 minutes and 20 meters, which is where my working area was, uh, etc. When they add up together to 60, you are all right. That was before diving computers, but there were already diving tables. Now, if one stays too long and one does not do a deeper stop, you know, you are in problems with the, uh, the deco and that is dangerous. So one has to stay a short time. And that was crucial in my research in the Mediterranean, but also what I did out here, because when I did those inventorization methods here to find out which was the best, what is the best? Well, the best is what I did initially, photographing the entire reef or the entire area, uh, and count and measure the surface of each coral. Then you know what is there. But that is very time consuming. So I was trying to find out what is the best method to get reliable results in two dives of 40 minutes. Now, back to my work in the Mediterranean, we first, we, we first did an inventory of what was living in space. So we had these quadrants and noted what was there with one of those inventorization methods, which luckily after I did my work here turned out to be the best. And how much area do you have to sample? Well, I recognize that there were two communities. Uh, let's skip this one. This is the little holes and, and, and caves in the, in the rock. But this is in, in the open. Now, if you sample a surface of zero, zero whatever, square inches, you will have zero species because you will not see anything. And when you enlarge the, the, the area, you will get you will catch more and more species. Uh, you can go on uh, indefinitely, but that makes no sense because we are limited in time. So uh, I try to find out when you increase the surface, when does this curve become asymptotic and when, when have you reached the total species or almost the total species. So that, uh, that, that gives you an idea of how much one should sample. And that's what we did after, afterwards. Um, yeah, well, this is this is the same. It's the same story. Now here we are sampling. This is one of the forty stations that I had underwater. That's one of those vertical ledges. They are very close to each other. This is one. That's the other. Um, that's an interesting slide, actually. What is going on? So, once we had done the inventory of the, of the different stations, we started measuring the environmental factors. You can see that we have very sophisticated equipment to measure temperature. Uh, this is one of the things that makes you chuckle now, uh, but that is the way we worked. And this is not normal. Thermometer. The normal thermometer is inside, but it is put in a larger tube with very uh, thick walls so that it does not get compressed by pressure, which can happen with a normal uh, thermometer. And there was this uh, mercury bath in which the thermometer, it, it was slow, of course. You had to wait a little bit to be able to measure the temperature. We did that all year long uh, throughout the seasons. We'll see that later, and then, of course, we have to take notes underwater. That has not changed. And this is about the temperature. Now you have here different depths. Uh, you can see zero is red, and 40 meters is what we call this fiber. Um, 
And the interesting point is here, when you look at zero, it goes up in several, which is normal, so the temperature goes down at the surface to about 11, 12 degrees in winter, and then go up to 21 degrees in summer. Much more than now, because of global warming. Um, but then you can see that, at, uh, which the is green, uh, as 20 meters, at about 20 meters, something happened. Here we, here we have the thermal climate. So we have a warm surface layer and a cold lower layer, which disappears with the winter storms when all the temperatures become the same again. Then we had to measure current, we thought current would be a major factor, and we constructed, that means I constructed, uh, I think this is the counter from uh, from a uh, record player. Um, uh, we build this a nanometer type. This was cut from an egg box, um, and this was a very strong current, as you can see, because the the rope that is attached to the surface board is completely gone. And unfortunately, uh, this did work. Strong current, but not a feeble current because the friction in that gear was, was too strong. So we had to divide something new, and here I'm ready to die with the latest invention, the ink cloud current meter. Now, what is an ink cloud current meter? This is an ink cloud current meter. Here we have a syringe with ink in it, and you push uh, on, on the syringe, and you count the time in those days we tied with a depth gauge and a watch. Uh, no uh, other means for that. So you count the time that this uh, ink cloud uh, travels from one ring to the other distance known, and then you know what the, even the feeblest current, the feeble the current, the more reliable it becomes. So we could measure the current at each stage. You can see me watching my, uh, my, my, my watch uh, to count the, the seconds that it takes for the uh, cloud to travel. Now, what do we have here? Well, what, is, what is he doing? Is he, is he fishing? No, he's lowering the second disk. You know a second disk. It still exists, I believe. And uh, this is a means to uh, measure the clarity of the water uh, which is uh, given by a coefficient k. We will see that coefficient k later. So what do you do with the second disc? It, 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 is, it is a given size, 30 centimeters diameter, and you lower it until you don't see it. Anymore. That gives you k. Um, this, this, this was my dad, actually, was helping me out. I, I'm helping my, my son to achieve his thesis in marine biology. Um, and then I developed a very sophisticated uh, electronics for 1917 it is. Uh, it was fed with uh, car batteries. It had 100 meters of cable and it had two light sensitive cells. One that stayed on the surface, and one that went underwater to my different stations and it gave immediately the percentage. So below there, it was 10% or 53% of surface irradiance is the correct term. Here you can see it, one could even switch to uh, per thousand. So it compares these two, uh, these two values of the surface and below, and it could be brought to all the stations. And I could, uh, first we had to Later on, we switched to hemispherical captures that were better. And uh, it, before each dive, we calibrated, we had the two together, and then the apparatus was regulated. So to show 100%, because they both saw the same. Um, then there is a filter inside, blue green filter, so it's only in that domain around 480 nanometers wavelength that we measured the light. And that is only a part of the total daylight that is coming in, because you have the whole spectrum, including infrared and ultraviolet, but we had only a part of that. 
So that's the big K. We will see that one later on again. And so one is staying at the surface, fully in the sun. My dad says, so am I. I would like a fresh beer. And then uh, I went down with the other cell. Yes, those gorgeous legs are mine. Um, and uh, in open water, I measured from the surface every five meters down to 40 meters. When I did that, uh, there was this buzzer that could be activated, and then a surface uh, observer was reading uh, how much percent that was. Now, when you are at any depth, let's say 20 meters depth, you have the open water value. But if you have a rock at 20 meters depth, it has a north side, it has a south side. So each station has only a fraction of, of what is at that depth total value. That fraction goes from zero when it's completely dark to one when it's received the same light as in open water, which is true for horizontal surfaces, for example. And so this is the lever that one could action, and then at the surface, my first wife was reading the percentages and writing it down. And she knew at which depth my things were taken. So I did, for instance, three buzzers, that means three times five meters, that's where I am. And a long buzzer means station. Now, you have the above water values, and they're very important because we have meteorological data on that. They are already connected. Uh, now, how much penetrates into the sea? Because you have surface reflection. Only a part goes under the water. Uh, and, well, that depends on many things. It depends on cloudiness. It depends on the water surface. The calm surface does not reflect the same as a very wavy uh, sea, and that will determine the transmission from zero meters above the surface, zero meters below the surface. This is a rough sea. It is a total, totally different situation from a calm sea. So all these factors we tried to incorporate into our study. It also depends. Uh, the transmission, it also depends on the height of the sun above the, 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 the horizon. When the sun is just rising, there is a lot of reflection. When the sun is in the zenith, which in Europe never happens, uh, the penetration is much more. And that depends, of course, on the season and the time of the day. Now, let's go back to these light values. We have the total light that is at the surface. That's a known value. It's, it's, it's known from meteorological data. Then we have our factor K, which was the one determining how much light is in my spectral values, in my blue-green values. So that's only part of the total uh, irradiance. And then we have the angle of the sun above the horizon, we have the cloudiness, we have the sea surface. All that uh, determines the transmission from above the surface to below the surface. And if you combine those, you get the irradiance value at zero meters below the surface, the subsurface value. Then we have K, that was set, you remember, the, the, the transparency of the water. And we have the depth. Now, those two together determine what the extinction is. When the water penetrates into, when the light penetrates into the water column, you have more and more extinction. And that means that you can calculate the irradiant value at a depth d, at any depth d. And then finally, we have this, the, the, the station value between 0 and 1. Remember, depending on how the, the places where my octocolors live are exposed towards the surface, north, south, etc., uh, under a ledge, etc. So, with those station values, station coefficients, we finally can calculate 
what is the irradiance at a given station. And that's what we did with all those data that we collected, plus uh, meteorological data. And here is an open water, and you can see that between for for the year or for the summer, it, it is the same trend. But you can see that uh, from zero meters, where you have well, what is it? About ten thousand uh, calories per square centimeter. You go down to one hundred at uh, at, at forty meters. 100 to 10,000, that's a factor of 100, roughly. So when you go down 40 meters, the light diminishes 100 times. You don't realize that when you are diving because our eyes are able to, to compensate enormously. But it is a huge difference. And for the organisms, of course, this counts. Now, I ended up, after a few years of doing all this, with my 40 stations. 1 to 40, and a lot of observations. For instance, so that's the, the number of each station. Um, what is the substrate? We had only two kinds. We had rock, those are the hours, and we had what is called coralligen, coralligenes in the Mediterranean. It's uh, organic rock, it's, it's calcareous algae, and they build some, some, some kind of reefs, mostly deeper. And then uh, I characterized the, the slope from horizontal to overhanging and caves, with sloping in between. And then, unfortunately, you'll see later why I said unfortunately, uh, sediment. I only characterized zero when there was very few sediment, and less when there was a lot. I'm not going into each detail with you, of course. Then the depth of the station in meters here. Um, this is the, uh, the station coefficient. Uh, the summer temperature, because that is when there is a difference between deep and, and uh, shallow. The irradiance for each station was calculated. The water movement from calm to turbulent. And then here are our species. For instance, the first one that I showed, which is maybe in the CC, uh, well, many stations you see a zero, the species was not there, but at some stations it was there, and this is the number of colonies that I counted per square meter. And I did that for all, I don't know if I remember right, 11 species. Um, I, I, I skipped this, but I compared the stations with a calculation. When you have two stations with exactly the same number of species, in the same amounts, you get a, a coefficient of 100. And if there is nothing in common, you have a, you have a value of zero. Most are in between. Now, if you do that, that is, if you do that, you get a value for each two stations together. Now, we have to move to the other side. We have two stations, stations number 13 and stations number 19. Uh, they have one, 100% if you prefer, uh, correspondence. They are exactly the same. Well, those two stations are the two stations where there are no correspondence, which of course they have similarity of one another. But more interesting is 12 and 18. They have a, a high value of correspondence. You can see that for, for different stations. And we are getting groups. I have here a, a, a uh, what's the word? Who's the violent? We have a violent group uh, that scores almost 50% similarity. Then we have another group. But these two only link together at a very low level. So this is a group. This is a group. But each color shows a group. Now, this is just calculations. They resemble each other or they don't. Now, each group can be characterized by what is there. 
afterwards, you can wonder, okay, what, what, what is what is what is wrong with what is right with 13 and 19? Well, no species, no of the proper species. Uh, here we have one species which is dominant and some of the other. Here it is a larger dominant. Uh, here's another species, etc. 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 PMC is the red gorgonian that we saw in the beginning. Uh, ES is the white gorgonian. And CR is the red color. Let's not look too much at the others. So we really get something there. Now, if I uh, look only at this species, never mind what it is, CC is one species. How many colonies I have per meter? Well, in station 27, I have 10 per meter. In station 12, I have 7. In station 5, I have 6.5. And I have 31 stations where a species CC is absent. That's one species. Okay, let's introduce a second one. Now, when I go to station 10, uh, I have Sorry, to station 27, I have 10 cc, but also well, 8 of AA per square meter. So now we have the, the, the representation of two species. There are still 17 stations that are not represented. Now, if I want to introduce a third species, which I do now by flattening the two and introducing the third dimension. So station 7 is, is, is very interesting because it has, it has PFC, it has AA, it has CC, uh, and now we have, well, we have still 17 stations that are not accounted for. So far, we have a nice representation of three species according to the stations, but I had 11 species, and that would introduce an 11-dimensional graph, which I cannot make. You cannot read and no one can understand. So we used a in that in those days new statistical uh, technique. You all know it, but in those days it was only used in uh, sociology, not in biology. If you have a 3D object like this nice fish. You see how 3D it is, you can turn it around. And well, it is 3D, but this is a flat screen. So how can I represent this 3D object in a 2D plane? Well, I can project it. This is one projection, um, and it gives two axes. This is the main axis. Number one, the biggest, that's the secondary axis. It does not give a very representative image of my fish. Okay, let's try another projection. You see now that those two axes together are bigger than the previous ones. This is a better representation of my fish. And finally, this looks nice. It's two very big axes. This is the best way to project a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional plane. It just takes an object and a random screen to do this. Now, mathematically, we can do this with an 11-dimensional uh, object. And that is done here. Uh, this is called correspondence analysis or factorial analysis, probably most know it by now. And in green we have the stations, in red we have the species. Look here. At the origin of those two axes, we have the, the two stations with nobody there. Remember? They have they don't weigh in the analysis. That's why they are here. Corallium, the red coral, weighs very heavily and it goes with several stations, maybe 14, 17, 18, 13 if you lost here. And that species weighs very heavy, and that species weighs very heavy. Asiolium is not it does not have much weight. It does not have much uh, inertia, mathematically uh, would say. Uh, but this axis is representative of almost 22% of 
prosthesis in my stations. And that one is almost 50, uh, together, that's in, with two axes out of 11, of, we already have 37% of, uh, of the stuff that, that is there. So, what do these axes mean? Well, here you have the light values. Uh, less than 100, 100 is a problem. The, the black ones, except this one, they are almost all there. The lightest one is here, but that one doesn't count. <coughs> but the dark blue are more or less here, and the light blue are more or less there. So this main axis actually is the axis of irradiance of light. And after the analysis comes the fact that light is the most counting factor for what we observe underwater. For my species in my place. Um, then we have another one. Remember, no sediment, sediment. Um, and I <coughs> added to that uh, cracks and holes, no sediment, and zero to nine, 90 degrees. Yep. And then the overhanging ones. Um, and well, it, it, it makes a funny curve, but it goes from no sediment to uh, no sediment and finally to, to sediment. So sedimentation, if you go to uh, no sediment and sediment, goes this way. Sedimentation appears to be an important factor. Unfortunately, I didn't measure it, I just said little set, few sediment, much sediment. If I had set up sediment traps, this would have been much more interesting. Unfortunately, I didn't. Now here you have the three dimensional representation of our 11 dimensional space with the different communities. The two stations with nothing, the stations combination here. So this is very heavily beaten by the surf, no octocorals, then we have B, that are the blue ones to the left, that's very uh, dark and calm water, that's the red coral, etc., etc. The different communities are clearly visible in this representation. I'll quickly go to that. Um, those were the field observations. Now we go to the experiments. Uh, sedimentation and light. Um, I did transplantation experiments. I have these concrete blocks. Um, there's a very funny sort of these, these are places where I could fix the, the different uh, cuttings of three different species. Um, funny thing is that a few years ago, so almost 40 years after I, I put those on the bottom of the sea. I never took them back. Uh, people saw these, a little bit overgrown. They saw these thick disks with protruding uh, things. And they, they thought maybe this is something dangerous. So they called the French uh, Navy, the French Navy with uh, the, the explosive squad came in. They recognized these immediately as being anti-tank mines from the Second World War, and they uh, they destroyed them. They exploded them. Well, they did. Um, so this is how the Gorgonian cuttings were were fixed, and at this exactly at a given length, 40 millimeter, I believe. And this was this looked like a good solution, but one learns when one does things, so this was even way more with uh, bags with concrete. That's what it looks like. And then we have three species here. But, but, we have a problem. Here it is gone, uh, in several places it's gone because where I pinched the cuttings of the coral, 
the process took place and then it wasn't pitched anymore, they were washed in. So there were or some sank in and I couldn't measure their growth either. So that was not a good thing. I we measured that, very sophisticated equipment. Um, so we thought of another way. Uh, if you take cloth pins, when the, the cutting gets the process, the cloth pins follows suit and they stay in place. Well, indeed, that way. So we have two species like that. Now, the idea was to put those cuttings in different places with different conditions and see where do they survive, where do they not survive, where do they grow quickly with the network, where do they grow, where don't they grow, and uh, get some conclusions from that because we know now that life plays a role, that segmentation plays a role, but can we, can we see if it has anything to do with the adult colonies? Consider these to be adults. Those things are gone. Why and nine to get there? Hopefully, don't get there. Bit complex. Um, well, sorry. So there were a few slides that were skipped because they don't show what they should show. Um, the conclusion of this was not very. Uh, what was clear that when you put red coral, which lives in dark places, when you put them in full daylight, as far as possible in the water, they, uh, they don't survive very well. But the other two, they survive under almost any condition. No real conclusion. So let's try with larvae. So we take the, the, the Pargonians that are about to spawn. That is an underwater observation. And suddenly you see the season has started. So they are there for weeks approximately they are spawning and we put them in basins and they spawn in the basins and we collect them with this apparatus very easy you suck it with creates a vacuum you put this something if you direct the nozzle at where the larvae are and then you get them that's how it works and then Believe it or not, but that's me. Um, then we uh, we observed the larvae, and we could see that they they are very flexible. They can get longer, and then with a sudden total contract like here. And there are also the malformations. Um, I have a rucksack. Let's go my way, no mine. Uh, my way, no mine. Um, we are going the same way. Uh, you are you, you have a funny look. Uh, who is saying this? Okay, so those we we try to get out of our experiments and we used only good healthy larvae for our experiments. The first experiment was to put a buoy uh, above 40 meters depth and to attach every five meters a small jar with some natural substrate, some natural rock, and an amount of larvae. Uh, each one had openings with uh, gates so that the water could go through. One was painted black, one was clear. Now, what do you think about an experiment like this? Do you like it? Don't you like it? Give me some feedback. At each step, two different light values, that is, to see what the influence of light is. Uh, and then all the depths, we have warm water, then we have cold water, this is in summer. What is the influence of all that? Is this a good experiment? I mean replicate, right? Sorry? If more than if one replicate. How many of those jobs you have per there, for example? Two. If two. What's the but I, but, but I was, I intended, I intended to do it several times. I had two weeks to do it. Uh, the idea was to see, do they settle on, on these pieces of natural substrate or not? What is the, when do they settle? Is it in different light values or is it just a very short range of uh, light values or temperature? Well, this is what I asked. 
any criticism? Well, you had one, but I, I answered that one. The problem being that the surface boy was being rocked by the waves. <laughs> the bar is never settled. Also, it's very difficult to provide the exact substrate as uh, different substrates can provide different chemical cures, but we maybe we need not much about that. No, but so, I, I, you are right, and I didn't think of that, but, but I can answer it now. Uh, the, the larvae that I use of the white gorgonian, they settle on rock, they settle on the, the, the almond rock as well. So, but it, it simply did not work. So we turned to laboratory experiments and we built a larval drone. Well, the first larval drone was rectangular, <coughs> one lamp at one side and, and the transparent wall. And so the year when the C experiments with larvae didn't work, that was one year lost because the body tubes cannot adapt quickly. So the second year I had this this, this larval basing, three different temperatures and a light gradient because of one light gradient. The larvae sit, uh, settled in the corners. <laughs> so the experiment didn't work. Uh, then we constructed the larval draw, no corners, and everything was rounded, so there was nothing for them to, uh, to, uh, to settle to. And this is a light filter, very transparent here. Gradually very dark there, corresponding more or less, you see the lid, uh, more or less to the gradient that you get when you go deeper. That's the larval drone, ready to work. The light comes from on top, so there's no directional uh, influence either. And then we let, we put those larvae, we mix them everywhere, and then the, the experiment started. And here we have the number of larvae at the start. Well, you have the number of larvae, you have so many compartments, so all the larvae are more or less at this 6.25% because they are mixed all over. Then, after two hours, we get a little bit more at the high light value and the rest stays the same. And then we have after three hours, after six hours, after nine hours, you see that the larvae tend to move toward the maximum light is. 12 hours and after 48 hours, more than 80% of the larvae were concentrated in the, the lightest compartment. And even the one next to it, there is very little left. Red and green is the right side and the left side, well, the left side and the right side. Um, so these larvae of Unicella, they are very light sensitive and they manage to move to where the light is. Now that explains a little bit why, they, why we find them in nature in places that are big. The same experiment with larvae of Corallium, the one that lives in the darkness, one would expect to find all of them here. But no, after, even after seven hours, there are, there are as many in the light compartment as in the darkest compartment. Just no conclusion possible according to light. Then, always with in mind that I don't want them to move towards the light, so with a projector, I project a slide with two light compartments, two dark compartments, but vertically, so they cannot move anywhere else. And this is what you get. Um, lots of larvae in the light compartment. This is again Unicella, the white Corallium. Very few in the dark. See it better. And of course, in the beginning, they were mixed all over. Now, um, when you project the slides, Light compartment, dark compartments, so too light, too dark. Most of them 
are in the light one. Then I just turn the slide a quarter uh, turn in the projector, and the dark compartment becomes the light compartment, and the dark, light compartment becomes the dark one, and they again move to the light part. So that's a confirmation of what we got. Uh, five hours after the start, and then eight hours after I turned the slide. And here's another experiment. Again, confirmation, huh? we get the same. But when I take the slide out and everything the slide, they even out. So they really react to light. And oh, these are in English. Well, I know. And when I start with everything dark, I switch on the light, I count them quickly. Well, they are evenly distributed. But as soon as I put the slide in, then you then get so. Unicella was nice for everything. It, it, it worked well in all the experiments, but uh, the other two, Father Mauricia and Corelli, they did not work well for us. Here are the experiments with the lighting of the red coral. Uh, as you can see, not a big difference between light and dark, a little bit more in the dark, but not significantly, especially when you go to the third and fourth experiment. They don't react to light. Then I let them crawl in a big basin with dark and light. Because I was thinking, these unicellular, when they settle in the, in the light, why do they settle? It's because they stop moving. So I, I, I measured every so many 10, 10 seconds where they were. And well, they would stop sometimes when it's out in the dark, but also in the light. No conclusion is possible. So they go to the light, but I don't know why. These slides are gone. Um, this is uh, an electromicrograph of the uh, white carbonium lava, the one that the slides indicate. And it has these structures with microvilli around the city. And that in, uh, in biological optics is known as a light sensitive organ. So they can really sense light. So the conclusion after five years of work is this. Um, and there is another one. But that's not the same Steven Weinberg, that's the astrophysicist who died last year. This is it. Lots of work, not to get lots of results, but uh, the sun was moving. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, criticism, remarks, the applause, the applause I already had. Thank you yeah, for that. I think you can switch over. Yeah. I just want to make a, you know, a, an observation, which is mostly directed to our students. And it is the ingenuity of how you, you know, design all these experiments in a, in a time when we didn't have a lot of technology available. And that, that to me is just you know remarkable. It's, it's just a, a capacity of uh, improvising and think ahead of time, and then you know like that current meter that you designed that was you know hilarious, but I mean it worked. Well, I mean, it, it worked. So that one of it worked the, and it cost less than ten dollars. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I mean everything today is coming you know pre-packed, so we don't pay too much attention on what's involved, uh, what the technology is. Going into all these you know, uh, uh, apparatus that we're using to measure environmental variables or uh, water uh, quality and all that stuff. Uh, but this is a clear example of how you know science actually evolved and how once you know at, at that time have to apply you know common sense and, and, and ingenuity to try to understand nature. 
thank you for that. Right. Really? Yeah, that. That's the reason I wanted to, to, yeah. to give this, this, this little, little talk to to show you. I mean, yeah. most most of you were not around 50 years ago to do research, uh, and I think what you say about ingenuity and improvisation it much still counts to you. If you don't have that, then yeah, it's always in your way. Have to. What do you think? You have to think with the problems that you face when you're in the field, and you necessarily have to improvise and solve. Or you know, go to the lab and think about it. You know, but it's a little bit easier because of all the technology that we have. But you know, that I mean, for me, it's a different. Well, I would, I would love to do it again. With yeah. The, <laughs> now, uh, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you, you know, leave your your uh, small uh, fraction in that system? How often you measure them? I mean, just for two weeks and then you left for a year and then come back. Yeah. Oh wow. So you didn't know what happened for a year in exactly. the system because there were no observations. Nobody was there. Time lost. Well, I could I could do laboratory experiments. I could do other things. Yeah. Try to work out how to project an eleven-dimensional surface on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. I know. Uh, but yeah, but you you sort of have no no idea what was going on in the water uh, for you know one year. Well, oh no, no, no. That's that, that's that's true for the larvae because the larvae are not there. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking but, about the small cuts that you put in the in your you know little cuts to measure growth. How often you measure those? Uh, I went there between three and four times per year. Per year, okay. So every three, four months. And the months. growth is very slow anyway. I mean, yeah. In the tropics, they do grow very much faster. Oh, That's why they are bigger. So go back to the. A, a branch of coral like this is one century old, of red coral. And what are your thoughts about then the effect of sediment? I mean, you think for gonians would grow, you know, vertically, they would not be affected by sedimentation, really, only on the base. So, well, when they start, and when they when they so are just just smothered, start. when they are small, when they small, then they will never grow any lower, lower higher. And there are these species, that are these small species that I showed at the beginning. They are growing on the surface. They, they are growing horizontally. They don't go up. So uh, those first stages of the life cycle are crucial. Mm -hmm. That's what sediment is really important. Yes. Hi. You, uh, this is a question related to your research while you were here. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm in the And I'm sure it's in the mind of many students that are working in your famous uh, library. <laughs> so the question is. Uh, from your research uh, the other day, I mean, your diving the other day to the original characterization of that area, what major changes have, have you seen in terms of coral cover and efficiency and so forth? Well, with Milton, we, we stayed there, what, half an hour? I think you were here. And I, will, I concentrated mostly on finding what was still left of my installation. This, this was my trip in, in history, and it was a sentimental dive and not a scientific dive. So I, I did not really look at what changes I could see, and probably even if I had, it would be difficult to, to tell. But my overall impression was that I saw the same thing. So this is first impression. Um, Remember, when I came here, it was just a few months after Hurricane David. All the Acropora cervicornis had been destroyed. There was just cervicornis rebel out there. Uh, there is no cervicornis nowadays. I don't know if in between those 40 years, cervicornis has come back and has been destroyed by all the hurricanes. I don't know. Disease. Sorry? Mostly disease. Why was it? Yeah. It has come back in small patches, but then. Right but I saw maybe there are some 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 sort of coins out there, but I, I saw nothing, not not consciously. Uh, so the the reef also in my in my days was dominated by, by gorgonians and by sponges, and 
a lot of Montastrea and Marius, which is not called Montastrea anymore. That was the major species. 70% of the surface was analyzed. I don't, I don't know what it is nowadays, but I saw, I saw quite a few. And of course, there's the Andrina, there is uh, that or not that. But uh, I didn't really see a big change. But one would have to do an inventory. Well, do. I mean, I have the data for, for 98. Yeah, no, but yeah, I think we did, uh, he did photograph more than square around, so I think we have to take uh, at least the data. The squares were still there? Uh, no, but you have, I mean, the, the, the 10 by 10, you know, uh, border was there, so. It's, it's, it's gone now, it's it's bits and bits. Yeah, he put um, uh, classic lines. Yeah. And so he did that. Oh, so you got it something like that. Yeah, more or less. It would be nice to compare them. Yeah. yeah. That would really be interesting. I mean, what, more than 40 years ago. Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't 40 years. He did that probably uh, 10 years ago. Okay. It was 30 years ago. Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm curious, you commented you looked at the growth of the octophorals, and like specifically, did you look at the accumulation of their calcium carbonate? That, uh, you know, they have this thing of the, yeah. I, I studied lots of spectrums because I did a revision of all the Mediterranean species. So uh, I put a lot of octocoral uh, pieces in bleach and then uh, made hundreds of drawings of skewrites. Ski, of ski it's not a good term, that's good news. Uh, but no, I never went into the of uh, crystallization because they are uh, crystals and they uh, are aragonized crystals. Sorry, I can't answer the Yeah, that's fine. I've been interested in that question for a long time and everyone I've talked to. I don't know. So have you gone back to, to those original sites? I mean, there were really significant mass mortalities of Gorgonian uh, due to disease in the 2000s. Have you gone back to see what how the Mediterranean look like? No, well, the, 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 in the Mediterranean, yeah. the Borgonian mortality is due mainly to two causes. Uh, one is temperature, when the temperature gets too high. And I observed that in 1972, I believe, and we had a very hot summer with very little wind. Most of the time, we walked with more or less 25 by the local wind coming down. Uh, but that year, no. So we had a very clear thermal line above the thermal line of 22, 23, something like that, below the school. Uh, and you could see this horizontal line with living Gorgonians dead body. So that was my first observation of the increase of temperature and mortality. Then, more recently, we had enormous mobility of algae is smaller than I'm talking about uh, bacterial diseases. I don't know. I can give you the, the rest. It's, it's part of this huge exactly. amount because of things that I don't know. Yeah. Was okay. that the base No, no, just the local Maybe. Maybe better, but they develop like food. The challenge could be the trigger. Yes. But, but not the cause. You could, you know, trigger bacterial population growth and then produce a disease and also produce the mortality. Or you can have, you know, heat shock, a thermal shock in the in the metabolism. Yeah, that has to be different. What about the role of nutrients? I mean, the Iranians are the topic, but the cost of development, there's probably more stuff going in. So probably reach some of the sites that, that you were working. Yeah, well, mo most of well, my sites were rather evenly distributed between the surface and Art. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Because, I mean, my study ended in 1979, before I came here. Uh, I have been back to those places uh, for, for a totally 
different reasons and, and they have to talk to you for the same time. So I've seen the places and they uh, still be fine. Well, I mean, where are you from? Where are you from? I'm not going to make the run, but where are you from? But you're so mad. It's, it's near the French standing point. Oh. Spanish border is definitely. There is a huge number of stations in the front of the main team. We found the two stations, another one in Britain. Roscoff is the other one. Okay, okay. And then there are other Marineros stations in France, like in France, there's Marseille, which is the middle one. There are smaller ones. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing in your uh, tour of the Caribbean this time around and your book like the right? Uh, I don't want to hold up everybody much longer, but I, I would be happy to to yeah. say some more. Oh, show so some more. Well, so well. okay. It's uh, 11.45. Okay, then um, I, but I cannot project directly from my computer. It would be nice if I could show what I mean. I'll I tell what I mean. So I, I, uh, I left research after I left Porto uh, Not entirely due to what I wanted to do, but it happened that way. And I became a secondary school teacher. I taught biology. Which was lots of fun. I mean, research is fun, but teaching is also fun. And uh, what I was particularly happy about was, first of all, that my contact with the students, uh, human interaction, and I learned from them when I explained things wrongly. Because suddenly, when the eyes go completely blank, you know that you haven't taught it the right way, so you have to adapt it. And in another way. Um, the other thing that I really embrace totally is that from being a specialist on orthocolos and then ecology and taxonomy, I became a general biologist. So everything from molecular biology to, uh, to the environment, uh, evolution, everything. And so it, it gave me those 20 years, of, 28 years of teaching, it gave me a broader view of biology than I had before. And I was lucky enough to teach in an international school, uh, which is very interesting because we have different cultures. Uh, teachers teach people from all the European Union, so 28 at, at the, the last time I was there, 28 nationalities, 18 languages. Uh, very interesting. Um, but also, what, what was very interesting was that I had three months of holidays before, and that I was paid very well. And I went back to the sea during my, especially my summer holidays, and I started making field guides. First one on the Mediterranean, my own love, then the Atlantic coast of Europe, then the entire Indian the Pacific, the Red Sea, which I did. Uh, two volumes. And uh, then my publisher said, could you do the Caribbean as well? So that's why I'm here. We are traveling, not, not now on this trip, but in several things. I'm covering the whole Mediterranean and the whole Caribbean, it's going to be and up to Florida, Bahamas to Florida. And okay, this is, this is a field guide on algae, sea urchins, fish, whatever. Um, then two years ago, we were in Indonesia when the COVID crisis broke out. And we were stuck in a uh, diving uh, center. Uh, we had no flight back to the We couldn't find a flight back. And they stopped working because there were no more customers. And they didn't let the boats out, go out just for, for us to. Uh, and but okay, I'll take my snorkeling and then I go snorkeling. And I went into the mangroves. And this was a world I had never, I never seen. It was 
I mean, that's the main role. But I have never gone in between the rooms as far as I could get and see the lights playing underneath of the rooms and see all the organisms that are fixed on the rooms. So I decided to do a book on mangroves. Coffee table, just nice pictures, nothing, nothing back here. And uh, so that is what we are doing as well, while we are here, not only going out to see my own so playing ground. Uh, so we did two days of snorkeling. Well, well, thank you very much. My pleasure. My we'll pleasure. Try. We'll when can I come back? back. <laughs> uh, thank you for questions? being there. Thank you for, uh, for your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank for you. But, uh, fresh air. Go straight to the past. Yeah. How things were done four years ago. Yeah, and, and also, I don't hesitate to, uh, to talk about the buildings. We learned from that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.